Well, good evening, everybody. Tonight, we're going to get back into the Word of God. And shortly here, we'll be going into Revelation 11. But I want to review the things we talked about two weeks ago when we were speaking about Holy Ghost words. Because the words we speak, our spirit, our truth, our life, because we have the Holy Ghost within us. And so the words actually have power to create, they have power to heal, they have power to do whatever we need to do in God. It says, uh, Job 3.25, we talked about this, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. So the first thing we see is that when people are afraid of something, it draws it like a magnet. But in Timothy, it says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. So we have the Holy Ghost. We have the mind of Christ. We have the Word of God. We have nothing to fear. We are the overcomers. We are the victors. We are the conquerors. Greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world. So whatever happens out in this world, it says in Isaiah 59, 19, when the enemy will come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against Him. And we are that standard. The Holy Ghost rises up in man. The Holy Ghost rises up in His people and puts down the works of darkness. That's our job. Jesus said He was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. And as He is, so are we in this world. And then last week we, we heard about how it was the plagues of Egypt and the deliverance through Moses. And we noted that it was dark in Egypt but it was light in Goshen where God's people were. God put a difference between His people and the people of Egypt. It says in Proverbs 18.21, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and, the, and they that love it will eat the fruit of it. You, are, you rise up to the level of your confession, of your words. Now you've got to believe what you're saying, and what you're saying has to be in line with the eternal Word of God, but if you do, then death and life are in the power of your tongue. If you just speak death, there's still death and life in the power of your tongue, but it's just death. And it will drag you down and, and create in your life the darkness that you speak. It says in Matthew 12, 36, I say unto you, every idle word that men speak, they shall give account of in the day of judgment. An idle word, we talked about that, it was inactive, unemployed, lazy, useless, barren, idle, slow. It was a, a word that did no good to speak. And the disciples in Matthew 17 came to Jesus and they said, why couldn't we cast this devil out? Because somebody brought a man possessed with a devil to them and even though they'd been casting out devils, they were not able to cast it out. And they said, Jesus, why couldn't we do it? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief, I say to you, first of all, there was the reason, because of unbelief. He said, I say, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, and you say to this mountain, be thou removed to yonder place, it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. We need to speak to the mountain about God, not speak to God about the mountain. Speak to the mountain and say, remove to yonder place. Get out of my way, get out of my life. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And it says in Luke that when people heard Jesus speak, and He's the one that lives in us, it says they were astonished at His doctrine because His Word was with power. Jesus' words were power. Our words are power because He lives in us. Christ lives in us. He is the hope of glory. And so when we think about that, we can see in the Word a great and glorious future for the children of God. And God's people, we need hope. We need to have vision. We need to know what God's doing, what God wants to make out of us so we can rise to the occasion. Because that's why He put, that's why Jesus died. That's why He filled us with the Holy Ghost. That's why we meditate on the Word. So we can rise up in God and manifest the Son to this whole world. So tonight's message, we're going to call it Words of Thunder. We know that our God speaks with power. We know that Jesus said, they said of Jesus, His word was with power. Now if we go to Revelation chapter 11, 
This is something, a vision of what's going to happen in the future. This is something, a vision of God's people. And it says in Revelation 11, 1, There was given to me a reed, John is speaking, like a rod, and the angel stood and said, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So they, this angel hand John a reed like a rod. And they used this to measure things in those days. So it was a reed. It was The estimates are it was about 12 feet high. And they would use that to measure different things. And the angel said, I want you to rise up, John, and I want you to measure the temple of God. What's the temple? Is he talking about measuring a, a building? Was there going to be a new building built somewhere that, that John was supposed to measure? No. He said, we are the temple of God. This is in the Spirit. He said, rise up, John. Measure God's people. Measure what's going on in the body of Christ. See who's ready. See what's being brought forth. See what is being built by God's people in the Spirit. And measure the altar and measure them that worship therein. And this was actually something that God had already spoken in the Old Testament. In Zechariah, there was a vision of a man with a measuring line in his hand. And they said, what are you going to do with that? He said, I'm going to go measure Jerusalem, God's people. So God is measuring his people. It says, for I, saith the Lord, will be unto my people a wall of fire round about, and I will be in the glory in the midst of them. That's what the, he said in Zechariah after he measured his people. So I want you to measure them because I want to be a wall around about them. I want to be the glory in the midst of them, the wall of fire around about them. God wants people to rise up in him so he can use them as a strong power in this earth. Thundering steps. People that, that thunder like Jesus did where they walk goes on in Revelation 11 too, but the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, is given to the Gentiles. So, so we're not talking, we're talking about God's people. And what is the one measuring rod for God's people? It talks about it in Ephesians. It says it's the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What kind of stature does Jesus have? What kind of stature does Jesus have now that he has come into his fullness? He has defeated his enemies, led captivity captive, is seated at the right hand of God, far above all principality and power. And he said, I want you to measure up to that. You say, how can man measure up to that? Because of what he did. Because Jesus paid the price. Jesus cleaned us out. And Jesus sent the same spirit the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost, the same Spirit that dwelt in Him, that did the works through Him, to do the same works through us. So it's okay when God says, let me measure, because He's given us a way to measure up. And He said in Revelation 11 too, now, He talks, first He said, I'm going to measure the temple. But then what does He see? He says, I will give power. Now, Notice that word power is in italics. It's, and when in the King James you see something of italics, the translators put that in. So it's not really there. I will give unto my two witnesses. What will he give them? He's going to give them the power to prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. He's going to give them a time when they are going to speak the word like thunder, like fire in the earth. These are the two olive trees. And again, this is a reference back to the Old Testament. That means the two anointed ones that the oil pours out of. And these are the two candlesticks. It says in the book of Revelation, candlesticks of the churches. So this is two churches full of the power of the oil of the Holy Ghost and their fire burning like candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now who's the God of the earth? Well, the Lord, our Father, He actually created heaven and earth, but He said in the Old Testament Psalms, He said, the earth belong, He's given to the sons of men. And what did the sons of men do with it? They gave it over to Satan to, to have dominion over. So the God of the earth right now is 
the enemy. And these two are going to stand before the enemy and they are going to proclaim the word of the Lord. They are going to do the works of the Lord. And if any man is going to try to hurt these witnesses, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. What fire is that? Again, it's the fire of the Holy Ghost. When the enemy will come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against them. And these people, these two witnesses, which are two, as we see, two candlesticks, so they're two groups of witnesses, are going to stand in the power of God, in the prophecy power of God, in the word power of God, in the fire power of God, before the God of this earth. And they are going to be part of how God brings back, brings the whole end of Satan's reign and rule about. Now, we read in Revelation 11 and verse 1, he said, a reed was given me like a rod was given me like a reed was given me like a rod to measure the temple of God. Now, the very last verse in Revelation 11, verse 19, says this. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. So 11.1 starts with measuring the temple of God. And then in 11.19 it says, The temple of God in heaven was opened. And what was seen inside of that temple? There was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. Now what is the ark of his testament? That's Jesus. Jesus is the very heart of of the temple of God. Jesus is very heart of God moving everything God has done. The heart of it was his son, his word. Just like in the Old Testament, in the center of the tabernacle, in the center of the temple, was the Ark of the Covenant. And those, it says in Hebrews, were shadows of the real temple in heaven. And we are, on this earth, we are the heavenly temple because we are citizens of heaven because we have been born again because Jesus lives within us. So when it says that the temple of God in heaven was opened, and that means that the God's people opened up. And in the very heart of God's people, there was seen the Ark of the Covenant. There was seen the Word of God. That's why the Word has to be primary in our lives. It has to be the heart of our lives. When, when I got saved almost 50 years ago, Jesus spoke to me and said, I have done this so I can be the center of your life. He wants to be the center. It's not about me anymore. It's not about self-will anymore. It is about Jesus. And here it is, as we come to the book of Revelation, toward the end of all things, the temple of God is open, and what's seen in it? The very heart of God, His Word, the Ark of His Covenant. And there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and a great hail. So what we see here is when, when God's people are so full, and they measure up, and the, the Jesus is right at the center, when they move, when they open up, then lightning, thunder, earthquakes, a great hail. In the Spirit, there is such a power. There is the lightnings of God. There is the thunderings of God. There is the voices of God. All of this moving through God, through us, in the Spirit of the Lord. Now, let's go back into the Old Testament a minute. There was a woman named Hannah who was praying in the temple and... Eli the priest thought maybe she was, she was so sorrowful, he thought maybe she'd been drinking and he talked to her and she was blessed and she had a son named Samuel who was going to be a great prophet. And when she had had Samuel, she was overjoyed and she spoke through the Spirit of the Lord and said this, 1 Samuel 2.10, The adversaries of the Lord will be broken in pieces out of heaven shall be thunder upon them. Now what do we read in Revelation 11? There will be thunderings. God's word thunders. It thunders in the spirit. It thunders and does a work. It thunders. It can, well we'll read later, it can even break the cedars of Lebanon. It's so powerful, the voice of the Lord. 
And she spoke this out. And then Samuel grew, and he became a judge, the last judge over Israel. And it says in 1 Samuel 7, 3, this exact thing came to pass in Samuel's life. It says in 1 Samuel 7, 3, then Samuel spake to all the house of Israel and said, If you do return to the Lord with all your hearts and put away the strange gods and Ashtoreth from among you and prepare your hearts to the Lord and serve Him only, He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines because once they've been overtaken by the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtoreth and serve the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to, to the Lord for you. So they gathered together to Mizpah, and they drew water, and they poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted and said, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. Now, so all the children have gathered together to Mizpah, well, the Philistines, who were over the land, didn't really like people gathering together at that time. They saw it as a threat. They saw it as something that should be put down. And so, when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together in Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and he offered it for a burnt offering holy to the Lord. And Samuel cried to the Lord for Israel and the Lord heard him. And Samuel was offering up the burnt as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them and they were smitten before Israel. Just exactly what Hannah had said when Samuel was a youngster. He said, she said, the, light, the lightnings and voices and thunderings there, that out of heaven God would thunder upon all his enemies. Now, we see here that what preceded the great victory for Israel, what preceded God thundering out of heaven and discomfitting their enemies before them was number one, they repented from the evil of the land, Balaam and Ashtoreth. They put that aside. Number two, Samuel took a suckling lamb and he offered it for a burnt offering holy to the Lord. And he cried to the Lord. So there was the sacrifice of a lamb. And that because of the sacrifice of the lamb, Samuel could call on the Lord and the Lord would answer him. The sacrifice of the lamb made a way for God's people to defeat their enemies. And so, did, so much did they defeat him. It says in, in this same chapter, verse 13, so the Philistines were subdued and they came no more into the coast of Israel and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Now very much that appears in the Old Testament is for us. So what's this talking about? Well, let's go now to the life of Jesus. And it's one the last feast that he was going to attend. And he was there and noise was going around that Jesus was there at the feast. And the Greeks that had come to the feast, they came up to his disciples and said, we would like to see Jesus. And when Jesus heard that, that now it wasn't just the Jews, but the Greeks, these are the Grecian Jews, were coming and they wanted to see him too. This is what Jesus said. John 12 and verse 27. Now is my soul troubled. What am I going to say? Father, save me from this hour. This is the cause I came into this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then came there a voice from heaven and said, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. It's 
So the Father, Jesus, prays out to his Father, the hours come, Lord, glorify your name. And the Father said, I have glorified it, I will glorify it. And the people, therefore, that stood by heard it and said that it thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus heard the words of the Father. What the people heard was a thunder, a loud blast in the Spirit, a loud blast to their ears. And they, they knew there was something, there was a power that was turned loose. This was the same power that discomfited all of the enemies of Israel in the days of Samuel the judge. And Jesus said, this voice didn't come because of me. It came for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. The suckling lamb was going to be offered to discomfit all the enemies of God's people. Now is the judgment of the world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus said, the voice of thunder sounded, and the Lamb said, this voice came for the people. This thunder comes for the people. God is here to deliver mankind from their enemies. And I am now come to judge the prince of this world. Just as in the days of Samuel, when he raised up that suckling lamb, the thunder sounded and the enemies were put to flight. We have come into a supernatural realm. Jesus said, we're not going to worship in Samaria. We're not going to worship on a mountain. We're not going to worship in a man-made temple. They that worship God are going to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We come into the supernatural realm. It says in Hebrews that we have come to Mount Zion. We have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. We have come to the reality that was behind all the types and symbols of the Old Testament. All the types and symbols of the Jewish religion. All the types and symbols in the natural. Now we have come to the spiritual through the suckling lamb, through the blood of Jesus Christ, and through the power of the Holy Ghost. That blood cleared the way to make us a new creation. The Holy Ghost came in to empower that new creation. Hebrews 12 and verse 13 or 18 says, You are not come to the mount that might be touched, that burned with fire, or to blackness and darkness and tempest. That's that's the mountain they came to in the Old Testament. A natural mountain. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which they that heard entreated the word should not be spoken to them anymore. The word came out. It was like thunders and lightnings upon the mountain. It was a natural mountain. But they couldn't endure the speaking and thundering and power of that word that was being spoken. They said, don't speak to us anymore. Let Moses talk to us. That was the Old Testament. It says, now, we are come to Mount Zion. We are come to the heavenly Jerusalem. Verse 25 says, see that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. If we were to turn away from the Word of God, if we were to turn away from the power of the Holy Ghost lightning and flashing and thundering in us, it says we would not escape because we would be neglecting a great salvation. It says, whose voice then shook the earth? See, his voice back then, it shook the earth. Even Moses trembled at it. But now he said, once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, see, yet, yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but heaven also. This word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things that cannot be shaken may remain. So the things that cannot be shaken are going to remain, which are... God's people standing on His Word. So, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace 
whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Why? Because our God is a consuming fire. Just what he said in the Old Testament. When in the Old Testament they held up the plumb line, he said, I'm going to be a wall of fire about him. Now it says our God is a consuming fire. So now we thunder and lightning inside of us. The temple of heaven, the ark of the covenant is inside of us. And there are lightnings and thunders in the spirit that can change everything for you. That can change things around you. That can change people. Hallelujah. For our God is a consuming fire. So, God promised a thunder in the earth. God did thunder in the earth. He thundered in the Old Testament. He thundered in the ministry of Jesus. And He is thundering right now in us. There is a spiritual voice. The voice of the Lord when we speak His word by the power of the Holy Ghost. When we command things by the power of the Holy Ghost. When we speak for something to happen by the power of the Holy Ghost. There's a thunder. There's a lightning that goes out by that. Even like an earthquake, it can shake things up. It can remove mountains. It can say to the mountain, get out of the way. Because there is a spiritual power. And that's what he is getting at here. There is a spiritual power. The same kind of power that you see when the lightning flashes across the sky or you feel when the thunder rattles your bones. That power is in the Spirit and that power belongs to us because He we has given us the same authority Jesus has. The book of Revelation starts out, verse chapter 4, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings, and there were seven voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Seven lamps of fire, lightning, thunder. This is how the book of Revelation begins. It said, John, come up hither. And John came up hither, and that's the first thing he saw. The throne room of God, the thunderings and lightnings of God. The same thing we saw come out of the temple at the end of Revelation 11. Revelation's vision, revelation to John of the heavenly realm and the things to come starts with lightnings and thunders and it continues on right up to the end. There is a lightning and thundering of God and our words are to thunder. Our, our deeds, our, our eyes are to flash with that lightning. The power of God is to flow through us like flashes of electricity, like flashes of lightning and it is to resound when we speak that word should resound in the supernatural realm and demons will flee. It'll shake them out of people. It'll set the captives free. It said in Psalm 29.3, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The, the God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon many waters. And in the New Testament, in Revelation, it says these waters mean people. God is moving. Like the prophecy we had a couple weeks ago. God is moving through the earth. God is thundering through the earth. And He's doing it through Holy Ghost filled, blood washed believers standing and believing the Word of God. Who are releasing the power of the throne room of God. Thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes and voices through the Spirit of God. The same voice that said, the God of glory thunders. And now what do we have? We have the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ shining upon us. And it went on to say in Psalm 29.4, The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. When you speak His word, it's powerful. It is full of majesty. It is something He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess that He is Lord. That's the majesty of His voice. That's the majesty of His word. Now, just before the scriptures we started with in Revelation 11 is Revelation 10. And Revelation 10 says this, And I saw another angel another mighty angel 
come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. So John sees this mighty angel clothed with a cloud, a rainbow on his head, legs like pillars of fire. And it says, And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. I mean, now think how big this is, that he could set his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the earth, this powerful angel shining like the sun. And he had this little book in his hand. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So he cried out like the lion of the tribe of Judah, with that kind of a roar, that kind of power of the prevailer, the one who prevailed against everything for our salvation. He cried out, and that was the voice of the Lord came out like that, like a lion roar. And when that roar roared, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now back in, and the next verse says, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, John sing this, And I heard a voice from heaven and said, Seal up those things that the seven thunders uttered. Don't write them. So at this time, this voice of the Lord, it thundered, and, it got, and, the, and heaven thundered back with the voice of seven thunders. And John was about to write down what those voices, what they were speaking out that was so powerful. And the voice from heaven said, don't seal it up for now. Don't write them. Now back in Psalm 81 and verse 7, it says, you called, this is a prayer, you called in trouble, and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder there is a secret place in God like it says in Psalm 91 under the shadow of the Almighty there is a secret place in God there is a place of, of such closeness to God he's your father you are his son you are clothed in his son you are filled with his spirit you are one spirit with the Lord he and you you and him all of this and it says it's a secret place of thunder. That's why the temple of God could be opened in heaven and there could be lightnings and thunders because in the secret place of the Almighty where we dwell, there's the secret of thunders. We're, right, we're dwelling in the place of the power of his word. It says in Exodus 20 and verse 18, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they were moved and stood far off. And they said to Moses, speak with us, we'll hear, but, but don't let God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, don't fear. God has come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Moses entered into the secret place of thunder. Moses entered in to that, that thick cloud where God was, to that, that place that no man can approach unto unless he's invited, or in our day, unless he's covered by the blood of the Lamb. Unless he is ushered into the holiest of all by a new and a living way where he can enter into that secret place with God, a secret place where he speaks to you, a secret place where you can hear his voice, a secret place where you manifest his son in this earth like thunder. It goes on in Revelation 10. And the angel that I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, he lifted up his hand to heaven. And he swore by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Think of that. Something that, that 
that we take for granted, something we think, well, we, we're born and we age and we pass on. Time. And he said, there is a time coming when there shall be time no longer. Jesus said his Father is going to make all things new. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he will begin to sound, which is the end of the tribulation, the mystery of God should be finished as he declared it to his servants the prophets. All of these mysteries, all the things the thunders have uttered out, all the things the prophets have spoken, that will all be done. And he said, when he said, again, the sound, the mystery of God will be finished. And the voice, verse 8, and the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me, John is speaking, and said, go, take the little book that is open in the hand of the angel that stands on the sea and on the earth. And what did he do with it? He ate the little book. And it was sweet in his mouth, bitter in his belly. So here... Here is this mighty angel. Here is the voice of God. Here is the voice of the thunders. Here is, here is the promise that time would be no more. And what did he want John to do? What did he want his servant to do? He wanted him to eat the little book. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It started out in the days like Joshua he said, meditate on my word day and night. Eat it. Fulfill up in it. The prophets ate his word. His people eat his word. This is what he wanted done. And then he said, and I read this is this is in the end. This is this vision is coming right to the end of, of this earth as we know it. And it's still at this point, the thing to do, the thing God wanted from his servant was to eat the book. Fill up on the Word of God. Take it into your mouth. In your belly it'll be bitter if it's alive to you. And you, what does that mean? It means you're going to let it out. You want to tell somebody. You want to speak it out. You want to speak so something happens. And he says in verse 11, now here's the sum of all this. Johnny, John has seen all of this. John has heard the seven thunders. And then it says in verse 11, after John now eats this book that came down from heaven in the hands of this mighty angel, he said unto me, he ate it, and the, and the voice of the Lord said unto him, you must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So here's John in this vision. And when he eats the book, what does the Lord say? Now you got to let it out in this earth. And what is the next thing we read? It's the vision of the two witnesses. And it said they must prophesy for three and a half years in the power of God, in the thunder of God, in the lightning of God, in the power of God. And you know what? That's the same thing he wants us to do. There may be many witnesses in the future. But what counts is how many witnesses does he have now? How strong is his army now? How mature is his army now? How do we measure up so that all of these things can be loosened and come to pass? In Revelation 14 too, the vision of the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. He said, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Here is the manifest, manifested sons of God. And it is a song to the Lord, but it's also a voice of thunder. They have power when they speak. Things shake when they speak. The devil trembles when they speak. Things change when they speak. And it says, now we come... Right to, right to the end before Jesus is coming. And it says in Revelation 19.6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah! The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. 
This is in the Word. It says, well, vision the people perish. God's people need to see where we're going. God's people need to see the glory that He has prepared for us to manifest for His glory. Hallelujah! The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. It's like the voice of many thunderings. And the next verse, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. Hallelujah! When we speak like thunder, when we eat the little book, when we measure up to the stature of the fullness of Christ, when we have the Ark of the Covenant deep in our heart, when, when all that comes out of us is lightnings and thunders and voices and the Word of the Lord and love of God for people that changes lives, let us rejoice and be glad and give honor to Him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Everyone that hears this message, let God arise. Let His enemies be scattered. Let sin be released. Let sickness be released. Be blessed. Be prosperous. Be healthy. Not just for you, but to release it into this earth so we as an army can have steps of thunder that shake this earth can manifest the lightnings of God to heal people to set people free and to bring them into this mighty army of the supernatural that God has planted in our hearts this is a glorious day to be alive it's not a day to draw back it's a day to go forward it's a day to go forward it's a day to abide in the secret place of thunder. It's a day to abide in the word of truth, the word of God. It's a day to look forward to the coming of the bridegroom, the Son of Man. Praise the Lord.